Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for watching arm training videos and welcome to the video about strength training. I'm making this video because I got a couple of requests. You know, what type of strength training is, is ideal for rowers and so on. Now, unlike many other YouTubers who do a great job, by the way, I'm not going to jump in a gym and say, do this and that and you will lose 10 kilos here and 20 pounds there. What interests me is how it affects the overall training planning. Training planning and, and rowing technique are the two things that matter for me the most when it comes to working with athletes. I'm actually re-recording this. So I've spent the last three, four days editing a video and by the time I was 75% through, I thought, what a blah, blah, I should redo this entire thing. It's a very complex topic. It's not like if you do this, it will all be good because everything kind of belongs together. All right, good. Now let's get started. I'm, I'm trying to structure this in a couple of questions. So the question is going to be, why do we do strength training at all? What types of strength training are there? What type of exercises do work and what type of exercises do I avoid? And this list will by far not be complete. And then I'm talking about how many reps and how many sets and why and so on. Mail time. I got something from Toby. Toby sent me a oh, look at the card. That is, that is so nice. Can you see it? Let me send you a long sleeve shirt and a short sleeve shirt to try it out. What a nice rowing shirt. Look at that. Oh, it just feels, you see this? It feels awesome. It's very nice. I really got to try this out then. Stick around. At the end of the video, I'm going to try this shirt. Let's get back to the topic. Number one, why? First of all, when we talk about strength, there, there are a couple of things I want to achieve with strength training. And full disclosure, there are actually coaches out there who say, as a rower, as an adult rower, you shouldn't need to do any type of strength training at all because, hey, you're grown up, you already have the muscles you need. So rowing is such a uh, endurance slash strength sport that if you row alone, it will get the job done perfectly. I think there's some truth to this. On the other hand side, I found that there are a couple of major, major, major advantages of doing strength training. And these are, first of all, a raw strength development. This is something, if you only do endurance and rowing is... You know, if you're one hour on the water, one and a half, two hours on the water, it's way more on the endurance side than on the strength side. Of course, the raw strength becomes more just because you become older. So I'm 39 now. My raw strength is higher than it was than it was 25 or 20, uh, working out 14 times a week. So that's something that comes with age. At the same time, there are certain things you can only do when you are in, in a weightlifting room or if you do asymmetric core. There are certain things you simply cannot do as well in the boat. In the rowing, the, the competitive distance is between three minutes, super fast, 1K, even less than three minutes in an eight, masses rowers, uh, up to nine minutes, lightweight woman single, uh, over a 2K. And that's a very short distance. So strength is a massive component. And then if we talk about the new formats of coastal rowing, 15 to 30 minutes, uh, typical race distance, but coastal rowing has significantly more load on the entire body than still water rowing because A, the boats are very heavy and B, the sea is usually very rough. The requirement for your entire structure to be super stable are simply greater than in like cycling. You don't need strength for cycling that much. For, stri for cycling, you need an engine, you need uh, endurance. Strength may be important for some very specific disciplines, but generally speaking, rowing has a much greater strength component than many other endurance sports. Second point, strength can also increase your total power output if we talk about asymmetric strength. So asymmetric core strength, you essentially link the peripheric muscle groups to functional units. And it doesn't mean you, you become stronger uh, in, in individual body parts, but it means the individual muscles start to function together as functional chains. Functional training is a big name right now and therefore you become stronger overall. The overall power output simply increases. And that's something you can do with rowing, but if you only do the same thing all the time, the rowing stroke, there's not much growth. Body economizes too quickly. Yeah, that brings me to the next point. Strength should be done in a non-endurance environment. You have to focus on the motion. If you do 15 overhead deep squats, not even with a lot of weight, it's a different focus than doing um, one hour of rowing. That, that's, and, and also the, the, the mobility requirement is a different one. So I like to get out of the, of the motion pattern. And if you row all the time, you become numb to the motion. You don't even feel the difference anymore. And 
In your body, you've got something that is called proprioceptors. So essentially, sensors in your muscle that tell the brain, hey, I'm in this and that position. If they always are used to the same motion, your brain doesn't sense anymore if emotion is slightly different or not. You need to sometimes break out of your motion pattern, and this is why I like to do strength training outside of the boat. And then a big, big, big factor is health precaution. Increased bone density, there are studies to prove that more and stronger muscles equals higher bone density. I heard, I didn't read, I heard about studies. The group of 80 year olds had a bone density increase of 1%, I think, while the comparison group did have a decrease of half a percent within a couple of months. Now imagine being 80 years old, you can improve your bone density or loose bone density. That's a big thing. I think strength is a huge issue also for non-rowers. It's a very, very important thing to preserve your health. The older you get, the more you have to do with this. Second, increased stability of tendons and ligaments. There are studies about this and I also observed this. Um, I, that's one of the main reasons I like to do strength because in rowing, we need stable joints. I stabilize the joints with strength in the off season. There are no studies I found. If you know of any studies, please send them to me. But improved stability of cartilages. I heard about this from other coaches. I haven't found studies about this, but I also observed this, that if you do strength training, the cartilages actually adapt and become stronger. Lass dich hämmern, das ist wurscht. Es klingt so, ja. So, my personal observation is that cartilages actually become less susceptible to injuries but that's a bit vague i can't really specify this because i didn't open up the joint and look at the cartilage and put it back in that's not doable but my observation is that joint pain has simply become less due to strength training controlled strength training i'm not talking about abusive strength training i'm talking about controlled strength training and this i blame increased stability of cartilages for that but that's my observation i have not done medical studies about this and i haven't read any so if you know more about this, please put it in the comments below. We'd love to read about this. Next point, what types of strength training are there? So it's generally speaking, there is a specific and non-specific strength training. So specific to our sport, rowing would be um, strength in the boat. So that would be low rate, high power. Super simple, that's specific. Non-specific would be everything else. Weight training, it would be body weight only training. It would be a um, range of motion training. I consider an overhead deep squat, for example, to be a full range of motion training for your hip. That's very important to mobilize certain parts you simply don't mobilize in the boat. Then core training, symmetric core training, straight sit-ups, asymmetric core training. I've made a video, I'm gonna link it in the description below. It's a full train along set asymmetric core. That's one of these training sessions where you learn to connect our right hand, left foot, for example, and therefore your overall power output increases. Don't focus on the time so much, focus on the precision of the motion as much as you can. Ten Next point, which exercises? Now, that list will never be complete because there are so many exercises you can do. Generally speaking, I think most of the Olympic lifting is a good thing because it's A, controlled, it's something all kids can also do as well. They don't have to use a lot of weight, but learn the technique. There's a channel I recommend you check out. It's uh, Zach Taylor, and he actually dissects all the different motions. But it was also interesting for me, I think, is um, Squat University. Some of their videos are very interesting. So I would recommend you check out these two channels. Generally speaking, there's a misconception when we do certain exercises. There are different types of squats. You can do front squats, you can do the back squats. You can do overhead deep squats, you can do jump squats, farmer's walk, you can do one leg lunges, you can do pistol squats, which I don't like, by the way, because I think they load the knee way too much. Of all the squats, there's usually one weak link in this entire motion, and it is usually not the legs. It is usually something around your back. And if you do squats and you go on full load and you try to load your body completely, and then you end up being in a sub-perfect position with your low back, then you simply have maxed out what your body can do. I recommend you see squats as a functional exercise, which it actually is. Most people start to do squats and think my legs gonna give in because if I don't feel my legs burn, I haven't done proper squats. No, the weakest link will give in first. Whatever the weakest link is, but most people it's the back. So if, if I do squats, I focus a lot on the back. I don't focus a lot on the legs. And then the question may be, well, but then my legs will never get stronger. Yeah. But if your legs already overpower your back, they will also overpower your back in the boat. So the point is that if you think you have to work on your legs and you have to find some way to work on your legs, because if your back always gives in when you do squats in that position, it's not perfect. It will be the same issue in the boat. 
and this is why I'm not a big fan of, of, of doing leg press, for example. I used to be one of those guys who did a lot of leg press. So my leg press weight for 20 repetitions was 360 kilos. Whatever I could load onto this thing, and I would do 20 reps, I would do four sets, I was bored. I had big, big, big legs. But it did overpower my back because my back was not, not in, the, in the least way able to handle any of that weight. Adi, my partner by Roa, once came up with a very interesting um, adaption to a leg press. He actually welded two handles to a leg press and said, all right, now load up the leg press and remove the back rest and now do the leg press again. And all of a sudden, people had have like 40 kilos, 60 kilos, that was already, you felt like an, an orangutan on, on the leg press because your arms couldn't, couldn't hold that and your back couldn't hold that. Everybody's around back here. The thing is, you need to see rowing as something that requires you to transfer force from the soles of your feet to the palm of your hands in order to get force on the blades. Now, everything in between is important. You can't just say, if I have big legs, all the rest of the issues will be solved by themselves. Yes. And I recommend you get an excellent physiotherapist because you will need one, a very good one, two, three, four years down the line. This is what happened with me. I worked extensively on my legs. When I was 15 years old, I did squats with 150 kilos, so 300 pounds. You went down to 90 degree angle, you held this for, th for, for 30 seconds, knees were shaking like crazy, talking about health, and, and the bar was bending and I felt like a hulk. And you went back up and you did um, squat thrusts or jump thrusts or whatever you call this. Excellent, my knees still hurt today and my back is still a bit thrashed today also from all this linear earth training. Just because your legs can do something, it doesn't mean it's actually beneficial for the boat. And that just saying, that's just talking about squats. Generally, when you do squats, I like front squats right now a lot. I like to work on the anterior chain. So everything that's the front part of your body and here on the ventral um, chain, that's the front part torso and also in a load environment. So um, usually people do a lot of sit-ups that's body weight only you to may maybe use a 20 pound disc or something i recently started to use chest press and with the same weight you do a couple of sit-ups lay flat on the bench move up a bit down move up a bit down that's how you load your abs for the first time and the reason why i focus a lot on the abs right now and that's just myself as a coach making my way through my, my my life as a coach and i've been doing this for 25 years now finding ways to make people more effective when it comes to rowing technique and I found one of the best ways to teach rowing technique is to focus on the anterior chain, not on the posterior chain. Because if you only focus on the back and the hip extension and so on, it's very difficult to keep a posture. Especially when we talk about using the upper body, you know, later, earlier, you kind of become numb to that. But what if you focus on your abs? In the Zoom live sessions, by the way, if you haven't joined armchain.com, three sessions per week, link in the description below, um, a couple bucks a month, and you have life coaching in the boat and on the end of the rower. The idea is to keep your upper body in place and have a lot, a lot, a lot of force going through the entire body. Because the more you load up your hip, the more effective that catapult is going to be once you use the upper body. And in these, in these classes, I focused on why don't you start the catch with focusing on your abs? As this way, you don't pivot too early because you don't have to stabilize your back. All you need to stabilize is your abs and your abs are not very likely to make the upper body rotate around the hip very early. I found this to be super effective when it comes to stabilizing the trunk throughout the first part of the leg drive. And also this way you can't overload the back because you're kind of out of your muscle memory, um, outside your comfort zone. Therefore, you don't really tend to use the upper body too early because you focus now on your, on, your, on your abs. They have to cope with all the leg power you've got. I like to do um, also full range of motion exercises, uh, overhead deep squats. I like to do good mornings. You don't have to use a lot of weight. That full range around your hamstrings and glutes and hips, that's so important. A lot of people simply don't have the flexibility. Finish position, hands away. Most people can't rotate the hip without bending their knees. And that's a huge issue. So I like to solve these issues uh, when we do strength training. This is why I like to do strength training because you can do it in a single out environment, non-endurance environment, outside the boat. Very important. In terms of lat and shoulders, of course, you can do bench pull, but make sure you're not too high when you pull. So it should be right here not where your chest is. 
pretty low. Otherwise, you don't activate the lat. Bend over front rows, big thing because it also activates the back. Very, very interesting. Pull-ups, of course, supported pull-ups, 45 degree pull-ups where your feet are on the floor and you pull yourself up. That also requires a lot of tension in your trunk. Then it's a lot of asymmetric stuff. So for example, push-ups on, on barbells, hexagon barbells. You would do a push-up, you would go down, up, lift one side up, go back, down, up, lift one side up. It's a classic, you've seen it before, but in the rowing community, I have not seen it a lot. And you don't have to use a lot of weight, but it's also very interesting how quickly can your muscles respond to a different load, which is exactly the load we have at the catch. So at the catch, you go from, a lot of people go from pushing forward to pulling. Ideally, you should be in a slight pre-stretch environment before you start the drive, so the muscles are ready, but most people are not ready. So I'm trying to teach the muscles how to respond quicker. I said this before, I try to avoid deadlifts. I do not consider deadlifts to be bad, but most people are too crazy about putting a lot of discs on their barbells. That's something where you can quickly um, yeah, injure yourself, especially if you do a linear warm up row and then deadlifts, that's almost a guarantee for injury. I know there was a study or, or paper about you shouldn't use the erg before uh, you do weight training. Absolutely get it, it overloads the back but I still think some cardiovascular stuff before you start weight training is very effective. Therefore, we hop on the bar rower, on the erg, on the boat for 20 minutes, then on the bike, we leave the back, then shake loose, do a bit of gymnastics, mobilization, and then we would do strength training. And this way, I think we bypass a lot of the issues. There's so many more exercises you can do. Oh yeah, hip thrusts, a big, big thing. Hip thrusts is probably one of the most important exercises in rowing, I believe. As long as it is an environment where you can safely execute the exercise, all good, very, all good. The question is now, next point, how many reps? That's where training planning comes in place. In rowing, we are still not a power only sport. Three to nine minutes or our 15 to 30 minutes coastal, that's a long time to depend on power only. Ultimately in training planning, my plan is to, or my job is to get my athletes to build up raw strength, cardiovascular, raw strength, cardiovascular. Ultimately these two have to connect. And the thing is, you can't really build, you can't really make yourself or turn yourself into a Hulk and at the same time uh, work in your cardiovascular development. It just doesn't work. Scientifically speaking, it's not quite sure whether you actually gain more muscle fibers or they're just getting bigger. I read contradicting things about this, so I don't know what the current point of science is, but my point of view or my point of error right now or wisdom or whatever you call it is that it's not quite sure what happens. But as a matter of fact, you see that things become more, shirts become smaller, so too small for you, so something's got to change physically in your body. And that makes it almost impossible to work on high performance endurance loads. It just doesn't... Everything, and I found you can work on strength and aerobic capacity that seems to go well together but it doesn't make a lot of sense partly does to go above the anaerobic threshold level this is why right now we have november in the northern hemisphere you would have peak of season around july august september so right now we have three weeks pretty much exclusive focus on weight and strength so if, if a masters athlete has five sessions a week Three of these sessions are actually weight training. Two of these sessions are endurance training to clean out all the stuff that's still floating around from the weight training session with um, a light to moderate endurance session. If you have seven sessions or 14 sessions per week, the same principle apply. My experience is, and this is something, you don't read this in the literature. In literature, most of the studies have been done with sports students. These are not high performance athletes. And even you know, if you're a master's rower and you, you, you train four to five times per week, you're probably better trained than most of these sports students. No offense to you sports students out there. But you, you have to consider what a rower actually does. Rowing itself is it's a huge, huge effort by the body. And it's strength and endurance. So a rower is usually better trained than most average people out there. So the sports literature has not been all, most of the studies have not been done with pro athletes because they were busy doing their workouts and, 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 and working towards their goals. So this is why you can't really um, look at literature and say, ah, okay, hypertrophy is like super slow, six reps, whatever you find in YouTube, it doesn't really work for rowers unless you are a super, super explosive athlete. So in rowing, you need explosiveness and endurance. Now, if you're an explosive athlete, of course you can kill yourself within 
five to seven uh, repetitions. But what do you do if you're a super endurance athlete? A difference here, real quick. I said this again in many videos. Classic endurance athletes, stereotypical endurance athletes, um, probably could do a 150 pound bench pull for 50 times. But ask that person to do a 154 pound bench pull five times, not possible. The other extreme, most people are mixtures, I know. The other extreme would be an explosive athlete. Happily does, I don't know, 300 pound bench pull eight times. But ask that person to do 150 pound bench pull 20 times, impossible. You can change this with training playing. That's also part of my job. In rowing, ultimately you need both. So it doesn't matter from which extreme you come from, you need to develop both. And with the strength training, I'm trying to already balance this out a bit. This is why when we talk about repetitions, I work with, with triple loading. Now, depending on the exercise, let me give an example. We would have eight to, tw eight to 15 repetitions. Uh, let's say chest press, eight to 15 reps, maybe 20 reps. Uh, after you know, the warm-up set, all good. First, first set, eight to 15 repetitions. Then a tiny Mickey Mouse break, 30 seconds. That's not a full recovery. Again, load, load, load until failure. So the, the goal is then in the first set, you want to put yourself, you, you want to use as much weight as needed to fail within 15 to 20 reps. In the second set, you try to fail within eight to 12 reps because you only have 30 second break. And in the third set, the third subset of one actually main set, you try to fail again after a Mickey Mouse break. So we try to empty the muscle three times in a row, boom, boom, boom. And I found this to be, first of all, extremely, extremely time friendly. Most people have other things to do than rowing, although it's hard to believe. And secondly, this is what works. This is how you build up muscles. This is how you become effective. If you do two sets of these, or three, or maybe four if you're super tough and crazy, there's no way you're not gonna have any gains. That's what I found to be effective. And that's the sweet spot of repetitions that is neither the classic hypertrophy training nor is it the classic endurance weight training. When I was in the team, we used to do things like 30 minutes consecutive bench pull with 60 pounds or 65 pounds. And after the first five minutes, you think, I'm never gonna survive this. Your head blows up like a tomato. Your arms become that wide and, and, and cables come out. But after seven, eight minutes, you kind of find, yeah, okay. And if it took 40 minutes, I could do it as well. There's no real benefit anymore after seven, eight, nine minutes. And, but back then, you know, our national coach thought it was super beneficial, so we did it. That's about my current point of error and wisdom, or wisdom and error, where I use these um, yeah, sets of, of, you know, three subsets within one set and try to really empty the muscle. You have to do this. And I try to empty it with as little repetitions as possible, knowing that most of my athletes will actually need um, eight to 15 reps. And it's also a technical thing. Not a lot of athletes are able to have a super clean um, squat. So if you don't have a super, clean, a super clean squat, you will hurt yourself if you use too much weight. Same with deadlift, same with overhead deep squats and all the stuff. So I have to take this into consideration. I can't just say um, five repetitions, 90% uh, of you max weight, blah, blah, blah. Another thing, how much weight? I know that there is a classic way of doing this. You do a one rep max test and then you say, you do 90% of your one rep max for so-and-so. I don't do this anymore. I used to do this, it doesn't pay. First of all, one rep max has a lot to do with technique, not so much with power. I know technique also comes into place when you do the exercise later on, but you don't differentiate between explosive and endurance athletes. And this is why it all becomes a bit weary. So what I say is, whatever the weight is, the first two, three weight trainings, it's, it's trial and error. How much weight do you need to empty your muscle three times with a 30, 30 second to two minute break? How much time do you need? Uh, how much weight do you need? So I ask my athletes, try it out. See how much weight you need to empty your muscles according to the plan, and this is the weight you use. And the next time you put on a bit more if you think you can have a clean execution. If you're not quite sure, use your phone, record yourself, look at this, does it look good? If not, send the video to me, I look at that. And I'm, I'm connected with all my athletes on Telegram, so I'm always available. That's how you kind of find the right weight. I'm not a big fan of, you, you cannot tell an athlete every single thing they have to do. 
and I found this to be super effective. So I, I prescribe weights in terms of if, if it's a warm up set, 80% of 20 rep max. Nobody has an idea what it is, but everybody understands, okay, if I would do 20 reps, I would probably do, I don't know, 80 pounds. So I'm gonna use 60 and da da is pretty precise. You also have to consider we're not power lifters. So we don't judge intensities that way. We use it for rowing, not for power lifting. If you are an Olympic lifter, of course, first of all, your technique is super clean. And second of all, this is your daily bread. This is like for us talking about what levels or speed on the water. That's a different ball game, but we are not in that ball game. We play a different game here. Last question is open. When and how often do I do weight training? So if your peak of season is um, June, July, I would start right October. I used to do more endurance than weight training. And over the last couple of years, I moved to more weight training. Right now, I'm doing three weeks, uh, a lot of focus on weights, three weeks, a lot of focus on cardiovascular development. Um, again, three weeks weight, three week cardiovascular. And this is becoming more favoring, um, it's becoming more favorable for, for endurance as we approach peak of season. But weight training is something that I like to do until about two months, two and a half months before the main peak of season. Uh, because strength is such a decisive component in rowing. Okay, I might do another video in a couple years and say, what a nonsense, I'm, a completely, I'm of a completely different opinion now, but that's my current point of error. And I'd like to share this with you. I hope it was interesting. So if you wanna work with me, go to rmtraining.com, I write training plans, do live sessions. Um, that's what I do. So happy to work with you. Program entry question here, drop me an email, call me, text me, Skype rmtraining.com has all the infos. Uh, connect with me in rowing.zone. That's a rowing enthusiast forum, which is growing uh, 260, 300 members already. It's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Post a comment, subscribe, and share the video with somebody else who can, you think could benefit from that. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much for watching until the end. And now I'm gonna hop into that Evopre shirt and see how it looks like. Evopre is actually uh, an Austrian company. They actually started out with rowing gloves. I'm one of those who actually likes to row with gloves when it's cold. Uh, and if the gloves are well made, it works. And the gloves they make are uh, insanely good. Feels yes, good, I like, you know, used to, when, when you bought shirts, um, it used to be that you are like, uh, I don't know, it's like, ah, uh, clunky, it doesn't feel right. And that's like very narrow armholes, so you have a lot of motion, you can move. I, I, I feel comfortable moving around. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's like a second skin, you don't even feel it. Usually these rowing shirts are stiff, and you go to the catch, it's like, Ugh. But this one is super nice, it feels very good if we go to the catch. I've got all the space in the world. Wow. Joby, that's an awesome shirt. Thank you so much for that. So I highly recommend you check out Ego Play and uh, thank you once more for sending it. All right, thank you for watching the video all the way to the end and looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.